Open up your Bibles with me to the book of Matthew chapter 14. So good to see you out on this beautiful Sunday morning. And I want to just tell you, I've been waiting all year long to get to where we are today in this series, for this series. Last year when the Lord was dealing with me about this year and what he wanted me to minister, and he gave me this particular sermon topic and title, and they told me where to plant it right here, you know, leading up to Back to Church Sunday. I was just extremely excited, and I'm really excited to be able to jump into this today because I'm beginning a series today entitled Weapons of Mass Distraction. Weapons of mass distraction. And I really do believe with all my heart that there are things that God wants to do in our lives and there are places he's trying to take us. And you need to know this, that the devil is not more powerful than you are. I need a better amen than that in this church. The devil is not more powerful than you. If he was, then the Bible wouldn't say, submit yourself to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. If he, was, if he had more power than you, he wouldn't be running away from you. He'd be overcoming you and he'd be tackling you, taking you down. The truth of the matter is the devil cannot stop us without some help from us. Most of the time, the way in which he tries to get us to cooperate and aid in, in him trying to take us down is through the vehicle of deception. He'll try to give us a lie, see if we'll buy into it, try to get us believing something that really isn't true and, 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 and giving in to kind of popular theory and things to buy into a lie. But the other way that he tries to derail us is through this vehicle of distractions. When God has us heading in a, in a direction... God has us moving toward this amazing miracle life that he's planned for us. And then something, somebody shows up to distract us, to draw our attention away from where it ought to be. So I want to read here from Matthew chapter 14, beginning at verse 22. It says, immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side. Somebody shout the other side. The other side. Somebody say, God was taking them to the other side. Then say this, and God's trying to take me to the other side. He was taking them to the other side, and he sent the multitude away. When he had sent the multitude away, he went up to the mountain by himself to pray. Now, when the evening came, he was alone there, but the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now, in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them, and he was walking on the sea. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, and they said, It is a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, be of good cheer, it is I. Watch this, do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, watch this, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Now, can we just put a, a pause right there and just acknowledge that if, we, if we're all in the boat together, 12 of us, and we're you know, heading across the Sea of Galilee and the winds start you know, turning up and, and we start getting nervous because, you know, it, it's hard to fight this current. And, and while we're out there and we're praying and trusting God to get us to the other side, and, and while we're out there praying, we see this figure come walking across the water. And you start screaming, because I wouldn't have been screaming, but you start screaming in the boat. <laughs> and because you scream, you make me scream because I don't want you to be by yourself screaming. And then that figure that we see out there in the water says, don't be afraid, it's me. We can't really see him well, but we recognize that it's Jesus because we hear his voice. How many know that the next words out of your mouth probably would not be? If that's really you, Jesus, tell me to get out of this boat and walk on the water with you. You better lift your hand before I cast that lying devil out of you. My next words probably would not have been, if that's you, tell me to get out of the boat and walk on the water and come out there with you. I mean, if I'm trying to verify if that's Jesus or not, I might have said, Lord, uh, if, that's, if that's you, then uh, uh, what's my mother-in-law's maiden name? <laughs> what did I have for breakfast yesterday? <laughs> but Peter says, if that's you, why says, tell me to get out of this boat and walk on the water to come out there where you are. And I love this next verse. So Jesus said, say this with me, come. Come on, say this with Jesus said, What? There was enough power, watch this, and one word from God to make a man get out of a boat and walk on the water. He said, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked, walked, walked on the water to go to Jesus. But, watch this, when he saw, somebody say distraction. distraction. When he saw that the wind was boisterous, he got afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, Oh, you little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, watch this, the distraction went away. Notice that Peter says, If that's you, Lord, tell me to get out of the boat and come to you. He steps out of the boat, and he begins walking on the water to go to Jesus. Now, I want you to get this because Peter is walking in a miracle. And I want you to understand this because Peter's walking in a miracle, but some of you are walking in a miracle too. You may not be physically walking on the water, but some of you right now, as I'm talking, you are walking in a miracle. The doctors didn't believe you'd be here. 
Come on, based on your background, you're not supposed to be succeeding like you are. Come on, say amen, somebody. Things aren't supposed to be going as well for you as they are. Many of you are walking in a miracle right now just like Peter was. And, you know, all the little Sunday school pictures want us to think that Peter, you know, only took a step out of the boat and collapsed right away. I don't believe that. I think Peter walked a long way on the water. And the reason why I believe that is because if you think about it, when they first saw Jesus walking on the water, they couldn't make it out that it was him. If he's standing right there by the boat, they would have been able to see that's Jesus. So he was obviously far enough away that they couldn't tell it was Jesus. Yet when Peter walked on the water and began to sink, all Jesus had to do was reach his hand out and grab him. He didn't have to come running over to him to find him. He reached out his hand to grab him, which means he got out of the boat and he was walking in a bona fide miracle for a nice long while until distraction showed up. When the wind started blowing, and can I just tell this? The wind was already blowing before he got out the boat. Remember, the reason why Jesus left his time of prayer to come where they were is because the wind was contrary, trying to keep them from getting to the other side. So even when he stepped out of the boat to start walking on the water, the wind was already blowing. It didn't start blowing. It was already blowing, but he was so focused. Somebody say focus. He was focused on the miracle at hand that he wasn't paying attention to the rest. Something happened. Probably was his little gown started blowing up in front of his face. And he noticed that, hang on a second, I'm not supposed to be doing this. And when the distraction kicked in, the distraction was intended to take him down. That is what distractions show up to do. Distractions show up as a tool of the enemy to get our minds off of God's agenda and over onto something else. In fact, I'll give you this definition for the word distract. The word distract means to draw the sight, the mind, or attention in different directions. Distraction means to perplex or to confuse, to draw the mind, to draw the sight or attention in different directions, to perplex or to confuse. I like to say it this way, distractions come to hijack our faith and force it to a different assignment. Distractions show up to hijack our faith. You know, like when, 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 when somebody's on an airplane and, and some, some person, terrorist person, tries to hijack the airplane. How many notice that typically when they hijack the plane, they don't say, keep going to your destination? They hijack the plane with the goal in mind of forcing the pilot to take that plane somewhere different than where it was going. Distractions show up in our lives with the goal in mind to try to hijack our faith. We're on this mission with God. We're walking with God. We're walking in a miracle. He just changed our lives. Things have gotten so much better for us. We're doing well now. And distraction shows up to make us stop thinking about this wonderful miracle we're walking in and get our faith over here on something else that's got nothing to do with this miracle. Now, understand this. Distractions can come via family and friends. Distractions can even come through promotions on our job. Come on, say amen, somebody. Amen. Distractions can come through relationships. Distractions can come through bad reports that we get that take all the wind out of our sail. Distractions can come through money. They can come through offense. Distractions can show up through gossip. But there are four weapons that cause distractions to the masses. That's what we call these weapons of mass distraction. Which means these are not just ones that, you know, you look at it and say, oh, that, that would never affect me. The ones I'm going to give you over these next four weeks are ones that I believe have the potential to impact every single one of us, adults and teenagers alike, weapons of mass distractions. The first one I want to dive into today is what we call the strange man and the strange woman. Thank you for that hearty amen. <laughs> Way too early for you to start getting quiet. <laughs> the strange man... Or the strange woman. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 2, listen to this. It says, wisdom will save you from the immoral woman. Now, the New Living Translation calls her, this, this lady, the immoral woman. I like the King James Version because it says the strange woman. Now, I want to stick a pen in here because, you know, the, the Bible was written really to a male-dominated society. So a lot of things that, 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 it, that it says is written from a male slant or male's perspective. But there are some strange women. But can we just set the record straight? There's a whole lot of strange men, too. And if you can't say amen, then I might be talking about you, brother. <laughs> Come on, there's some strange women, but there's some strange men too. So when we're reading this, it's saying woman and it's saying her, but let's keep in context that it could be a strange woman if you're the guy, but it could be a strange man if you're the woman. And the Bible is telling us, watch out for that strange person. Wisdom will save you from the strange woman or man. It'll save you from the seductive words of the promiscuous woman. 
She has abandoned her husband and ignores the covenant that she made with God. Entering her house leads to what? Yes. Come on, I can't hear. Entering her house leads to what? Yes. It is the road to the what? Grace. The man who visits her is what? Doom. He's doomed. Watch this. And he will never reach the paths of life. That's good. He'll never reach. If you go to, if you go to wave with this woman, if you hang out with this guy, if you allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you today and don't take heed to what he's saying, the Bible says you'll find death showing up, you'll find the grave showing up, you'll find doom showing up, and you'll never reach the pathways of life. In other words, what he's saying is you will never fully accomplish what God designed for your life. You know why? Because distraction kicked in. In other words, I'm heading toward God's way, heading in God's direction, but then this relationship shows up. This guy at work acts to take me out. This lady, you know, at work starts complimenting me on, on how nice I am and, and, and how handsome I am and, and how lucky my wife is to have somebody like me. And if I don't recognize, why well, this the trappings of the strange woman or the strange man, the Bible says I will get distracted and never end up on the pathways of life. The Bible has a whole lot to say about paying attention to the relationships that we allow into our lives. In fact, one of the most famous spots the Bible talks about is in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, where it simply says this, flee fornication, which means don't play around with it. Don't, don't, don't try to overcome it. Don't try to see how strong you can be. It means get up, get on your bicycle and ride away. <laughs> uh, or get on your hoverboard and zoom, zoom on out of the room. Don't play around with it. It says flee fornication. Well, now what is fornication? Fornication comes from the Greek word pornea, P-O-R-N-E-I-A, pornea. And it means inappropriate sexual activity. And I want you to get this because it refers to all sexual activity outside of a God-ordained marital union. And it includes adultery, homosexuality, lesbianism, pedophilia, bestiality, incest, and watch this, any other sexual contact that is not between a married husband and his wife. Can I get an amen in this church? Amen. Now, what does the Bible say? The Bible says don't play around with that thing. Don't try to see how, how well you can handle it. Don't see if you can manage it and keep it from getting out of control. The Bible says if you, if you find yourself drifting in those areas, the Bible says get up and flee fornication. Why? It, it can and it will become a distraction. How, I mean, how many folks are there, man, that have ended up not fulfilling the purpose of God half of them or having to dramatically alter the, the course of their life because a pregnancy showed up outside of wedlock? Or because of, you know, some, some disease that, that showed up. Or because, you know, they, they were focused and doing well in school and, and then this relationship shows up. And, and now, you know, may, maybe it's a relationship that you know you ought not be in. And, and, but, but, it, but it's fun and, and you got that little taboo nature that comes along with it. But you're not focused. You're not accomplishing the things that you were in the past because now you're, you're sneaking around and trying to remember what you told your spouse that, that, that you were going and what you were going to be doing. Am I the only one up here? Y'all looking at me like, I, we had never heard of this in our lives. This is so educational, Reverend. Come on. You know what I'm talking about. When our, our soul starts getting vexed because we allow ourselves to be, become open to something from the outside that should not be a part of our lives, God loves us so much that he will warn us that that thing coming in from the outside is designed to distract you, lead you down a pathway of death, Open up a grave, doom you, and cause you to never end up fulfilling the pathway that God has for your life. Not to mention all the emotional drama that comes along with that. You know, one of the reasons why so many people are just so vexed in their spirits is because we've allowed all these doors to be open. To where we may not be going too far with it, but we've gone far enough for it to vex our spirit. And God is saying, hey, I got more for you than what that is right there. And I need you to cut off that distraction so you can get the rest of what I have in store for you. How about this? Proverbs chapter 5 says this. It says, For the lips of an immoral or a strange woman or man are as sweet as honey. Her mouth is smoother than baby oil. <laughs> I added the baby oil part. <laughs> but in the end, watch this. In the end, it feels that way at first, but in the end, she is as bitter as poison. She is as dangerous, or he's as dangerous as a double-edged sword. Watch this. His feet go down to what? Come on, his feet go down to what? Yes. Her steps lead straight to the what? Grace. For she cares nothing about the will of God for your life, the path of life. 
she staggers down a crooked trail and doesn't even realize where she's going. And over and over, I, I won't read them all. You, you can go through the book of Proverbs over and over. It talks about the strange woman. In, in, in chapter 7 of Proverbs, it talks about this strange woman. It says that she teaches us that her, her words are smooth. Her kiss is seductive. She offers to do ungodly things to the, to the guy, and his ego feels good about it. But then the Bible says, in the end, it only leads toward death. Over and over, God is telling us that we got to watch the strange woman, the strange man. And I want to take this step further because even if you're in a relationship and you all are keeping it holy, you're keeping it righteous, you still got to watch to not allow that man or that woman to become an idol in your life. I need a better amen than that. God never intended, even in a healthy dating relationship, God never intended for that man or woman to become a little mini God whereby we cannot listen to what God is saying because we're too concerned about losing this relationship. You know, most of you have heard me tell the story when, when April and I met. You know, we were uh, in college together at Michigan State University. I was a, a sophomore. She was a freshman. And, you know, part of what happened when the, 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 the freshmen were coming on campus, all the sophomore guys were looking for the young freshmen. And everything about me is what her daddy had warned her not to. He said, stay away from those sophomores. Stay away from them light-skinned boys. <laughs> stay away from them fraternity guys. I was all of that. And when I, when I saw her, true story, I saw her walking through the cafeteria. And, and I said to myself, sitting there eating my food, I was like, whoa. I said, now, if I could get with her, I would settle down. I, I'd stop everything. I would settle down. Now, you say, what did I need to stop? What did I, what did I need to settle down from? That is none of your business, what I need to stop. <laughs> But I said to myself, if I could get with her, I would stop everything. I'd settle down, just, just, just two of us. And long, long story short, after a couple months, you know, I, I introduced myself to her. And, and then uh, one, one day I was out in front of the, 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 the dorm, and a couple of my, my fraternity guys were out there. And they had some, we were standing out in front of the dorm. This is the way I tell the story. We were standing out in front of the dorm. <laughs> and her and her, her roommates start blasting this music from, from their, uh, their dorm room, right? Because they, they saw us out there, so they wanted to get our attention. So they start blasting the music. <laughs> Because I don't know where the music came on. Back to life, back to reality. So we have this. Da, 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 ah, 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 ah. You know, they wanted to get our attention, right? So we came up to the room just to ob oblige them. And I realized, whoa, that's that pretty girl that's on the cafeteria. And so we made conversation. We, you know, we, we started the process of getting to know each other. Eventually, after a few weeks, we ended up started starting to date. And the way it had normally worked with me, after, you know, you've been dating for a few weeks, maybe, maybe a month, you kind of make your move. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Don't, don't leave me out here like I'm the only one know what I'm talking about. But this time I go to make my move, and, and she's like, well, no, that doesn't happen until we get married. I'm like, wait a minute. No, I mean, I don't do that until we're married. It's a true story. I hadn't had known her for two months. I said, well, will you marry me then? <laughs> Thankfully, she had enough good sense to say, no, she wouldn't marry me. And then we went home for the summer and started going to church together. When I went to her church, Word of Faith, just like this church here, started being taught the Word of God in a way I could understand it, it gave me the why behind you need to live right. So, you know, I was living right then because she was mandating it. But when I came to her church, I understood. I got revelation. My life got changed. So for the next three and a half years, watch this, we kept our relationship holy. It took us almost four years before we were ready to get married. We kept our relationship holy from that point. Now watch this, though. But even in that, when I, I, about a year and a half or two years in, I recognized God was calling me to ministry. I mean, it was no doubt about it, man. God was doing a work in my life, and I came and told her, the Lord is calling me to ministry. I don't know what that means, but I got to obey God. And true story, our relationship was going well. We were getting along great. And she looked at me, she said, I'm glad to hear God has called you to ministry, but I don't believe that I can be a pastor's wife. And I said, well, I love you and I want to be with you, but the truth of the matter is, I'm not letting anybody stop me from doing what God has called me to do. So we reached a, an impasse to where we literally, we, we didn't break up, but we said, we need to give this some time so we can figure it out. And, you know, she was, at, she was asleep one night and three angels showed up in her bedroom <laughs> with smoke. And they said, thou fool, you better let this man walk away. I'm telling the story. Leave me alone. <laughs> now, she, she, I mean, through prayer, she did. She woke up one day and realized, hang on, this is what I've been believing for all my life. But the point I'm making is she was willing to let me go. And I was willing to let her go because we both were determined we're going to serve God even if we can't serve God together. 
My point is, in any relationship, even when you're keeping it holy, you still have to work to make sure you don't let that man or woman become a God in your life. Amen. Give me a good amen, somebody. Amen. Give me an amen, somebody. Amen. Now, I want to give you three dangers of the strange woman or strange man. Three dangers that come along with it. Why it's important that we pull ourselves away from these relationships. Number one, if you allow yourself to stay connected to that strange man, it'll cause you to defy good sense. Just, just lose all, all, all sense. It'll cause you to defy good sense. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 30, Solomon said, there are three things that amaze me. No, and there are four things that I don't understand. I don't understand how the eagle glides through the air. He barely flaps his wings, but he's gliding. He says, I don't understand how a snake slithers on a rock with no legs. I don't understand how a ship out there in the ocean before, before there was motorized propulsion I don't understand how a ship navigates through the ocean. Watch this. And he says, and I don't understand this relationship between a man and a woman. Makes you do, makes you do crazy. I don't understand this relationship. An adulterous woman will consume a man and then wipe her mouth and say, well, what's wrong with that? Listen to this. Lust connections that disguise themselves as love connections will cause you to make decisions that are as bad or worse than a stone-cold drunk. Lust connections. That we, we put a bone in and say, I love you. I, I, disguised as love connections can cause us to make decisions that are as bad or maybe even worse than somebody who's been drinking alcohol all night long. Because, you know, when you've been drinking, it, make, it, makes, it, it makes your rational senses go away. You, you, you're not as sharp. Things that you would normally say no to, you end up saying maybe to them. Maybe, then you say yes to them sometimes. I'm saying that when we get in these lust connection relationships, it can make, cause us to make decisions that are as bad as a stone cold drunk around here. Now, I hope I don't offend you when I say this, but this is how we say it when we keep it real. We, we, we say, it's what the booty do. <laughs> Y'all acting all spiritual on me. <laughs> that's, that's what the booty do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, there it is. That's what it do. Which means if you don't keep a guard, you'll find yourself doing stupid stuff. And when somebody goes, how in the heck would they do that? That's what the booty do. <laughs> now, again, y'all acting all spiritual like you have no idea. You know some folks. And some of us have been those folks that have made some horrible decisions because we let our bodies tell us that it was okay to take off and do this thing that we know was not the right thing to do. I'm preaching better than you saying Amen. Reminds me of the, 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 uh, the movie called Harlem Nights. Eddie Murphy and Richard Pryor back in the day. Some of you know, some of you know the movie. And there's this, this one scene in the movie where uh, this guy, he's the, he's the bag man, goes around and picks up all the, the money for this gangster. And, and uh, Eddie Murphy and Richard Pryor set him up. They, they introduced him to this girl named Sunshine. <laughs> That's what the booty do. <laughs> they introduced him to Sunshine and and Sunshine, they end up in this hotel room, and Sunshine s s seduces him. And, and when, they, when they get done, you know, she gets up, she gets ready to walk away, and she turns around and says, Richie? He said, yeah, yeah. I think I'm falling in love with you. <laughs> and a little tear runs down Richie's eye. When she walks out of the room, he picks up the phone, he dials home. He says, kids, put your mama on the phone. <laughs> Girl, I ain't never coming back home. <laughs> Well, wow. when we find ourselves, come on, I'm trying to help somebody right here. When we find ourselves engaging in these relationships that we know are not God's best for us, and our emotions get involved and our bodies get involved, before we know it, we can end up making decisions that defy good sense whatsoever. Second thing that makes this really dangerous is that the strange man or woman will cause us to jeopardize the things that matter the most, cause you to put at risk the thing that matters the most. Most people in here, if I came right now and just asked you, what, what is the most important thing to you? It's not your car. It's not your house. Most of us will say our family, our friendships, our career, our ministry. But when we find ourselves in these strange relationships with strange men or women, it'll cause us to jeopardize the thing that matters the most. And we've got to constantly ask ourselves the question, is jeopardizing this worth it to have that? Is it really worth it to put this at risk to be able to enjoy that over here for a little while? Are you still out there? You're going home. That's why even when it comes to, to teenagers dating, teenagers, young adults, you got to always be leery when, when, when you're dating somebody and they want to get away from your family. 
Can I, can I just help you parents and, and young people? Uh, when you're dating somebody and they constantly want to come to your house, pick you up, and be gone. They, they constantly want to hang out somewhere. They don't want to be around, especially when you, I don't mean if you, you got crazy family. I mean, you got family that love God. Come on, somebody. You got family that are reasonable, that, that hear from the Holy Spirit. There's a reason why that guy never wants to come and hang out at your house. Because he know your mama got the spirit of discernment on her. He didn't want to shake your daddy's hand because he's afraid them demons going to say, ah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Remember when April and I first started dating, her parents fell in love with me pretty quickly, but, and, and I didn't know until later on, you know, one of the reasons why. But they said uh, uh, the other guys that she would date, they would always want to come to the house and, and, and quickly leave. They said, but when I came, I came to the house, and I would come in, sit down on the floor, take my shoes off, hang out there, play with her little brothers. Now, they, they didn't know then, but there wasn't any going nowhere. She had already shut that down. <laughs> Might as well hang out at the house. <laughs> but the thing that caused them to have their hearts become knit to mine, though, is that I wasn't trying to run away from them. I was getting to know them. I mean, when we were going out to dinner, I wanted to go out to dinner with them. Always be leery when somebody you're dating, somebody you're considering dating, they want to be with you, but they don't want to be around any other people that matter to you. There's a lot of ladies that would still be alive today if they hadn't let some guy draw them away from their, their, their family and draw them away from the group of people that could see stuff that maybe they can't see. Because there's a thing about it. love is blind, but marriage is an eye-opener. You see stuff later on that, I ain't know that. <laughs> but when you're around people that care about you, sometimes they can see things that your blinded love won't allow you to see. Amen. Third reason why it's dangerous to, to, to hang out with a strange man or woman is because there is no good ending to that relationship. No matter how many alternate endings we try to come up with or try to look at, none of those end well. And the reason why is because if God is not for it, then we have no grounds to expect things to go well. There's no reason, there's no way for it to go well when God's grace and his blessing is not on it. So now, how do we win this battle of the strange woman? Let me give you three, three ways. How do we win this battle of the strange man or the strange woman? Number one, we've got to admit it. Got to admit, got to own up to it. Got to acknowledge that, you know what, I, I'm, I'm hanging out with this person, but this is not, this is not God's best for me. This is not the way God intended. Come on, help me out somebody. This is not the way God intended for this to be. There's no need to hide it, cover it up, or try to justify it. Just stop for a moment and own up, admit the fact that this is not what God intended for my life. The Bible says in Psalm 51, the sacrifice you desire, God, is a broken spirit. You will not reject a broken and repentant heart, O oh God. Which means, why? Well, I love what Pastor Chris Hodges says. He says, God is never asking for perfection. What he asks for is transparency and humility. That's good, man. You know, if God was requiring perfection, none of us in here, including me, would, would ever be able to live up to it. And I'm not talking about years ago. I'm talking about even right now. If, if perfection is what God re required, I wouldn't be on his top 10 list, his top 100 list. But he doesn't require perfection. But what he does require is for us to be transparent and have some humility about ourselves. And it takes humility to just come back and say, I'm wrong. It takes humility to say, you know, I let myself get caught up. I got emotional. I got driven. I need to fix this and own up to where I am. You know, repentance, there's a power that comes from repentance. But because we live in a society that has such low self-esteem running around, many people equate repentance with failure or being a bad person or not measuring up to somebody else's standard or some other negative feeling. Can I just tell you, repentance is not a bad thing. In fact, repentance is a power. It's an amazing thing. All repentance, if you really want to know what does the word repent mean, it, it literally only means this. It means to change your mind. Walk into the refrigerator at 2 o'clock in the morning. I'm going to get that piece of chocolate cake because I deserve it. You think about that dress you're going to try to fit in, you repent. Nope, I ain't going to do that. <laughs> change your mind. Right? To repent simply means to have a change of mind. And when you have a change of mind, it causes you to have a change of heart. You have a change of heart, watch this, it causes you to change your actions. <laughs> Repentance and being sorry are not the same thing. We can be sorry all day long and still not repent. 
Repentance happens when I, re- when I wake up and go, you know what? This is wrong. I don't, I don't need to be with him. I don't, I don't know why I'm, I'm even allowing myself to, to, to still hang out with him. And we make a decision to go ahead and sever that tie or fix the relationship to where it's supposed to be. And you'd be amazed at how much clearer we begin to see life. Our focus comes back when we simply do this thing called repent. My friend Miles Monroe, before he went home to be with the Lord, he used to, he used to have this saying, and I love it. He said, to repent is simply to come back up higher where we really belong. You know, the top floor of any apartment or, or hotel is the penthouse. So in his mind, to repent just means to come back, to, re- to read, come back up higher where we really belong, which means I'm done living down here in the basement. I'm done accepting less than what I deserve. Come on, talk to me, somebody. I'm done letting somebody talk to me any kind of way or treat me any kind of way. I'm done letting them call me when they don't have anybody else they want to talk to. I'm done being somebody's second place something. Come on, say amen, somebody. I'm, I'm done letting somebody just kind of, you know, reach out to me when, when their wife is out of town. Now I'm going to come back up high. I'm, rep- I'm coming back up to the penthouse where I belong. And I'm going to trust God that when God sends me somebody, it's going to be the right somebody. Yeah. We've got to admit it. Second thing we've got to do is avoid it. Yeah. Once we've acknowledged it, we've got to then avoid it. Matthew 5, 29 says, so if your right eye causes you to sin, then take it out and throw it away. It's much better for you to lose a part of your body than to have your whole body thrown into hell. If your right hand causes you to sin, then cut it off and throw it away. It's much better for you to lose one of your limbs than to have your whole body go, uh, go off to hell. Now, he's not literally saying that you need to pluck your eye out or literally cut your arm off. Watch this, unless that's what it takes in order to get away from that thing. What he is saying is that we can't walk around and play around with this thing. We got to take some drastic measures because we have to come to this realization that I'm not strong enough to manage sin. I'm not strong enough to manage this relationship with somebody when, when my emotions get all involved. So what he's saying is if you find yourself in relationship with the strange man or the strange woman, don't play around with it. Go ahead and take drastic measures to cut it off. But the Bible says this, can you build a fire in your lap and not, be, and not burn your pants? Do you think you can walk barefoot on hot coals and not get blisters? What he's saying is you get close enough to that thing, close enough to that thing, in time, it's going to eventually burn you. That's why right now, you know, brothers, right now it may, it may seem innocent. You know, you're just communicating on social media a little bit and every now and then a little message, ha, 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 ha. Or, you know, you go into the copier and, and uh, every time you go to the copier, you keep running that same young lady at the copier. And she tells you, she, she's filling your head up. I've never seen anybody make copies like you. Your wife is so lucky to have a copy maker like you. How do you know when it's gotten to a place because you're looking forward to seeing her again? You're, 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 you're grabbing stuff to make copies. You don't even need copies. You're just grabbing stuff to make copies. Hmm? We've got to acknowledge it, number one, but then we've got to avoid it, which means take drastic measures. He said, pluck your eye out if you have to. Cut your arm off. That means if you've got to move from your neighborhood to get away from her, move. If you, got, if you got to change jobs or careers, it is worth it to not end up having your house led straight to doom. If you got to get off social media altogether, block so-and-so, totally get away from so-and-so, if that's what it takes, he says, don't play around with it and think you can build a fire in your lap and have it not come back to burn you at some point. Then the last thing, number three. We've got to admit it, avoid it, and then we've got to account for it. This is quickly becoming one of my favorite verses. It says, make this your common practice. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other. Watch this. So that you can live together, you can live whole, and you can live healed. Notice the Bible doesn't even say confess your sins to God. God knows our sins. There's a place for acknowledging it before God so we can repent. But it, it, that's not what he's talking about here. See, what he's talking about here is we need a place in our lives where we can be open and honest and confess to somebody else. I need to be able to have a Kevin Brown or a Daryl Marshall in my life or an Adam Shaw where I can just come to him and say, look, I know I'm the pastor and the bishop, but this area is an area of temptation for me. And I need you to hold me accountable. I, I need you when you see me, ask me about that area. You know why? Because if I got somebody else holding me accountable, it makes it a whole lot harder for me to live over here in this little secret world. Can I get an amen from somebody? 
See, there's one thing you need to understand about the devil. He specializes in trying to keep the secret between you and him. But what he doesn't tell you is that he plans to tell as many people as he can and shame you as soon as he can when he can catch you slipping. That's why we got to live in accountability. That's why it's important for you to get plugged into a small group. I'm not standing up here harping every week about small groups so we can just say how many people we have. I'm convinced. It's, we can't grow where we're supposed to grow. We can't get free from our yesterdays. If all we're doing is coming and getting an inspiring message on a Sunday, but then we do nothing with it the rest of the week. We need to live in community, man. And that's why we need to, that's, that's one of the biggest mistakes the church as a whole has made. We tried to make a church, the church a place where you had to come and act like you had it all together. One of the biggest places of liberation that we've come to as, at Impact Church is that we can show up here every week and say, God is using me, God has anointed me, but I don't have it all together. And I'm not going to act like I, I got it all together to impress you because while I'm impressing you, I end up hurting me. So I'm not going to give you all my dirt because I don't know you like that. But I'm going to find some people that I can get real with, that I can be open and honest and transparent with because in that process, I can recognize that I don't want to let that strange man or that strange woman come into my life to destroy what God had in store. Come on, stand to your feet. I got a confession I want to lead you in. And I want you to say this and mean this with all your heart as we declare that we're not going to allow that thing from the outside to destroy what God's doing inside. Say this out loud like you mean to Say, I am the seed of the Most High God. No, say it like you mean. I am the seed of the Most High God. I've been born into righteousness, and my true character is holiness. I shun the very appearance of evil. I have learned that fornication is inappropriate sexual activity, and it refers to all sexual activity outside of a God-ordained marital union. I know fornication is sin, and failing to flee fornication is sin. And I know the paycheck for sin is death. So I make a decision today. I will not get paid. I will exercise dominion over sin. I'll say no to the thoughts of sin before they become actions of sin. Today, I repent of anything in my life prior to today. And I seek the strength of Holy Spirit to help me walk in godly purity. I submit to the healing power of Jesus to make me whole in my heart so I'll never again turn to wickedness to cover up my real pain. David said in Psalm 101, I will set no wicked thing before my eyes. I agree with David and I choose today to guard my heart and guard the heart of my children. I resist the strange woman, the strange man, and any other distraction that would try to rob me of my God's best. Holiness increases my capacity for the blessing. So I fully expect the hand of God to be stronger in my life as I raise my standard. I declare, come on, divine health. Come on, raise your hand. I declare divine health. Divine prosperity, divine protection are working mightily in my life. When I pray for things, they come to pass. My angels are on assignment to work the Zoe life of God for me. And nothing is hindering their assignment. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And I will live this way. Come on, I will live this way. Come on, I will live this way for the rest of my days. In Jesus' name, amen. Now come on and shout like you believe that. Yeah, come on and give him praise. Come on and give him praise in this place. We thank you, Lord God. Praise you, God. Thank you, Lord. Now look up here at me for a moment. The reason why God loves us enough or the reason why God has given us what he gave us today is because he loves us. The Bible says when God corrects us, he does it because we're sons or we're daughters. We're his children. How I many you know the kid down the street is not yours? You can look at their behavior and go, that's horrible, but you don't, you don't, you don't bother them. But your own kid? I'm not going to let you grow up to be horrible because I didn't love you enough to correct you. 
God loves us so much. Watch this. He can see what the enemy's trying to use to distract us and get us off track. And he loves us so much to bring us here together to our safe environment to let us know that, that little thing that you think only you and the devil know about or you and your best friend know about. Now let's go ahead and fix that so it doesn't lead us down that pathway of death and destruction. But instead, we can keep going in God's blessing. Now, if you're here today, look at me. If you don't know Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, there's nothing perfect in us. We, we made it real clear. We're not, I'm not up here. We're not doing what we do because we've got it all together. We're doing what we do because we came to this realization that we can't do anything without Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am not a way. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father unless you come through me. Which means what he's really saying is, no matter how many good deeds we do, no matter how much we get baptized or sing in the choir, none of those things are good enough to give us a relationship with God. You must be born again. The way to get born again is simply to open up your heart and believe that Jesus died for your sins. Believe that God raised him from the dead. And then surrender your life to him. Not committing to be perfect, but committing that from this day on, I give you control of my life. you got the right to command and be obeyed. The Bible says if you do that, you will be saved. So if you're here today, you don't know Jesus as your Lord, you're not born again, you're not saved. Or, or another way to say it, if you were to walk out here today and breathe your last breath, if you don't know for sure that you go to heaven, I want to ask you, will you let me pray for you today? I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to call you to the front of the church. I'm not going to ask you to tell anybody about your mistakes. Right there at your seat where you are, I want to lead you in a prayer that will change your life forever. So while every head is bowed, all eyes are closed in prayer. If you say, yes, pastor, you just described me. And you want me to include you in on this prayer. Let me know right now that I'm praying for you by lifting up your hand right there where you're standing. Thank you. See that hand there? Another hand there. Thank you. Another hand there. Beautiful. Another hand there. Another hand there. Another hand right there. Another hand there. Thank you. Another hand there. Thank you. See that hand there? Another hand right there. Another hand there. Another hand there. Another hand right there. Thank you. Another hand there. Thank you, ma'am. I see that hand there. Thank you, ma'am. Another hand there. Thank you, sir. I see that hand right there. Come on. Who else? Who else? You, you, obviously, you can hear you're not by yourself. Others have already raised their hand. We're just waiting on you. You say, how do I know if I should be raising my hand? Something on the inside is telling you that it's time to go ahead and surrender your heart to Jesus Christ. Thank you. See that hand right there? Thank you. Another hand there. Beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you. Two hands in our overflow room, out of court. Thank you. Another hand there. Beautiful. Beautiful. All over this room, hands are going up. This is beautiful. You can put your hand down. I want to look one more time across the auditorium. If you didn't raise your hand the first time, but in your heart of hearts, you know that you should have. Don't let the enemy stop you. Don't let, don't, don't let a fear of embarrassment stop you. I promise you, I'm not going to call you up here to the front. The only reason I even want you to raise your hand is so that you and God know I hear you talking to me, Lord. Anybody else will say, yes, Pastor, I need to get in on this. Go ahead and raise your hand. Thank you. Thank you. Another hand there. Another hand right there. Beautiful. Another hand there. Thank you, Lord. All right, every one of you that raised your hand for prayer, I want you to do something for me. I want you to pray this prayer just loud enough for you and God to hear it. And right there at your seat where you are, God's going to transform your life. Say this, say this right there to yourself. Say, dear God in heaven, thank you for loving me today. Thank you for reminding me that you love me right here where I am. I do believe in my heart that Jesus died for my sins. I believe you raised him from the dead and he's alive right now. So I'm asking you, Jesus, to come into my heart. Save me now. Forgive me for trying to live this life apart from you. I make this one commitment. I surrender my life to you forever. And I will never turn away from you. According to the Bible, I am right now born again. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, put your hands together. Help me celebrate with these men and women. Come on, man, all over this room. <laughs> Come on, yes. Praise God.